Hi everyone, it's Louis from Defining Moments Canada, and thanks for joining us today for our virtual roundtable on Canadian Nobel laureates. Defining Moments Canada this past year has done a commemorative project on Canadian Nobel laureates. We've covered all Canadians who have won Nobel Prizes. We've talked about Art McDonald, we've talked about Donna Strickland, we've talked about Gerhard Herzberg, Frederick Banting, Lester Pearson, a whole breadth of Canadians who won since the early 1900s uh, the most prestigious prizes in different categories. This leads to the question though, is that everyone? Are there other Canadians who are deserving, who should have won, who could have won, or who should still win a Nobel Prize? Canadians have won prizes for peace, for chemistry, for physics, uh, for literature, for medicine. There are many different types of Nobel Prizes, but there must be other Canadians who could have won, who could have been recognized with this honor. And this is what we want to answer today. We've asked multiple different organizations who create typically pedagogical content for students, and we've asked them, who do you think should have won a Nobel Prize? Of the answers we'll cover today, you'll see there are many reasons why these people maybe didn't win a Nobel Prize. In some cases, they weren't eligible. Uh, it's important to remember that groups cannot win Nobel Prizes except for the Nobel Peace Prize. So a group, an organization, can't win a, a prize for chemistry, for example. Uh, this could be a factor. There's also the fact that Nobel Prizes are awarded to people who have international impact. Maybe these people's impacts were concentrated within Canada. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why someone may win or may not win a Nobel Prize. And we want to kind of start questioning uh, who is deserving of one. We want to let students and anyone who's watching this video question who deserves a Nobel Prize and who doesn't. Who doesn't fit the cat categories? Are the categories too restrictive? We want to get these questions posed. So what we did is we went around and we asked people we've worked with, organizations that we're familiar with, what they thought. So first, let's go see, we talked to Megan from Let's Talk Science. Let's Talk Science is a pedagogical organization. They create resources, kind of like what Defining Moments Canada does, but they focus on the science side. We do more history, they do more science. We asked Megan at Let's Talk Science who they thought could have won or should have won a Nobel Prize. And she talked about Yvonne Brill, a rocket engineer from Manitoba. Let's go and see what she had to say. Hi there, my name is Megan and I'm from Let's Talk Science. Today, I'm going to be presenting Yvonne Brill. Yvonne Madeline Brill was a Canadian-American rocket scientist born in Manitoba in 1924. Her area of expertise was rocket propulsion systems. When she was in high school, her teachers told her that science was a useless career for a woman, and that she was better off to open a shop in town instead. But Brill was inspired by the adventures of Amelia Earhart, the first woman to pilot a plane across the Atlantic. Yvonne wanted to become an engineer. Unfortunately, the University of Manitoba barred Yvonne Brill from studying engineering because she was a woman. Instead, Brill studied mathematics and chemistry and graduated at the top of her class at just age 20. After her studies, Yvonne Brill moved to the United States, where she found a job in aerospace engineering. During this time, she also took night classes to earn her master's degree in chemistry. It is believed that Yvonne Brill was the only woman to work on rockets in the U.S. in the 1940s. So what did Yvonne Brill do? Yvonne Brill worked in a number of different organizations where she made significant contributions to the field of physics. At the beginning of her career, she participated in multiple pioneering studies that defined the rules for companies that make rocket propellants, which are similar to fuels. Some of her most notable work includes work on the propulsion systems of Tiros, which was the first weather satellite, work on the Explorer 32, which was the first upper atmosphere satellite, and work with NASA on the Apollo missions, the Mars Observer, and the Space Shuttle. However, the invention that we believe should have earned Brill a Nobel Prize is her invention of the hydrazine resistojet, or the Electrothermal Hydrazine Thruster, acronym EHT. EHT is a rocket system that uses electricity to heat the rocket fuel hydrazine. Brill was the first rocket scientist to suggest using hydrazine for this type of thruster. This technology was mainly used on communication satellites that needed to stay in the same position relative to Earth, although EHT has also been used on other rockets. Brill's innovation helped these satellites stay in orbit, made them more fuel efficient, and allowed them to operate longer. This technology has been used since 1983 and is still used today. The most impressive part about this invention is that this was a side project that Brill worked on in her spare time. 
So why should she have won a Nobel Prize? We believe that Yvonne Brill should have won a Nobel Prize in physics because she made significant contributions to the field of aerospace engineering that are still used today. Since 1983, her invention of the hydrazine resistor jet has been used on hundreds of communication satellites, which allow radio, television, and telephone transmissions to be sent anywhere across the world. On top of her work in rocket science, Yvonne Brill spent her entire career championing the role of women in science, technology, engineering, and math, otherwise known as STEM. As a mother of three and one of the only women in her field, Brill faced numerous barriers on her career path and made it her mission to help other women succeed in STEM. In fact, right up until she passed away in March of 2013, Brill was writing letters of recommendation and nominating other female scientists for awards. Excellent. I think Megan really makes a strong case here for Yvonne Brill. Her contributions were really worthwhile, and it's important to note that in the history of Canadian Nobel laureates and Nobel laureates as a whole, women are massively underrepresented. So someone like Yvonne Brill deserve recognition, not only for what she did, but for what that representation would mean. Next up, we'll hear from Rowena at the Museum of Healthcare at Kingston. Now, this organization puts forth the history of medicine and healthcare in Canada. It's an actual museum in Kingston, Ontario, but also a place where on their website you'll find a lot of resources for teachers that deal with healthcare and medicine and the history of that in Canada. Now, Rowena put forth Leon Farrell, who's a biochemist from Ontario. She's also a woman who also dealt in the, the scientific field, so similar to Yvonne Brill, but in a completely different scientific field. Let's go hear what Rowena had to say. My name is Rowena Gallen, and I'm the curator of the Museum of Healthcare at Kingston in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. You may recognize the machine behind me. This is called an iron lung. It is a machine that breathes for people who can't breathe for themselves. It does this by changing the air pressure inside this chamber, forcing air in and out of the lungs. My Nobel nominee is Dr. Leon Farrell, who was whose research was part of the reason that we don't need these anymore. So to talk about her work, first I have to talk about polio. So poliomyelitis is a viral infection. It mostly affects the gastrointestinal system where it is not particularly dangerous, but it can migrate into the bloodstream. From there, it can damage the connection between the brain and the muscles through the spinal cord, leading to paralysis, uh, chiefly in the extremities, so your arms and your legs, but it can also paralyze the chest, which at that point is when you would start having breathing issues. Polio was sometimes nicknamed the crippler. And polio became a growing threat throughout the industrialized world in the early 20th century. Uh, in Canada, by about 1910, epidemics were starting to sweep the country. 1927 to 1932, there were several epidemics in central Canada, including in Manitoba and Quebec. 1937, Ontario had a major polio epidemic, which is when a lot of these iron lungs were built. And in the early 1940s, by the early 1940s, I should say, researchers were, a lot of researchers were working really hard on how to deal with polio. So how to treat it, how to treat some of the problems associated with it, and in particular, a lot of people were trying to find a vaccine against it, because vaccines save lives. So. Eventually, this is cracked uh, by Dr. Jonas Salk. He built on a lot of work by other researchers, created the first polio vaccine by killing the polio virus with formaldehyde. Uh, so with a dead virus, you can inject it into the system. It's not going to do any damage, but the body will learn to recognize it. And then when the live virus gets in, the body can immediately attack it. So he had, uh, he had polio virus. He learned he could kill it with formaldehyde and make a vaccine. But as we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is not enough to create a vaccine. You also need to be able to immunize the entire population. That's where he ran into a problem because he could only grow polio virus in a test tube and he needed enough to immunize millions of people. That's where Dr. Leon Farrell comes in. So Dr. Leon Farrell graduated with her PhD from the University of Toronto in 1933. And a year later, she joined Knopf Laboratories if you're familiar with Canadian medical history, you probably remember that name. So they were major players. They continued being major players under the name Sanofi Pasture. They were very involved in public health. Before Dr. Farrell joined, for example, they were involved in insulin production in the 1920s. So 
She, when she started, she was working on toxoid vaccines against staphylococcus and dysentery, two other diseases that you really do not want to get. And it was at this time that she developed what would be later called the Toronto Method. So this was a method of stimulating the growth of cells, cultures. And what she would do is she would use a liquid nutrient medium. She would put the cells in a bottle and they would be rocked gently back and forth in a machine for several days and this would stimulate cell growth. And one of the things this could be used for was the creation of vaccines. For instance, uh, she used this method for pertussis vaccines, which is whooping cough, another very bad disease. So we already had a vaccine, but her method allowed the creation of more vaccine, which made vaccine vaccine creation cheaper, and therefore extended the reach of child immunization programs, which is obviously very important. So, doc so Dr. Farrell is given the job of creating 3,000 liters of poliovirus fluid for polio vaccines. And what's fun about her is that she was really the whole package. She was a great innovator, but also she was a great organizer and a great leader because she not only had to make poliovirus, she had to set up the facility to make poliovirus. So she needed to recruit a technician, she needed to set up the equipment, she needed almost 200 monkeys a week, which is so many monkeys. But she did it. She created enough poliovirus to be made into vaccines. In 1954, the first test of the immunization program rolled out. 1955, polio vaccine is a success. By 1956, Connaught Laboratories had contributed to more than 2 million doses of poliovirus vaccine. And she was not someone who was content to rest on her laurels. She would continue to work on various public health innovations. She also worked on a vaccine against cholera. She worked on a better way to test poliovirus immunity. And, she, which is my personal favorite, she also worked on a new strain of penicillin that produced 20 to 30% more penicillin than the original strain. If I can summarize her work in a couple of words, it's that she always wanted to do more, bigger, and better. Unfortunately, because she was a woman, uh, she tended to be overlooked, including Dr. Salk gave, gave a talk at one point at University of Toronto, and she was not allowed in the room because she was female. And it's really only recently that we've come to appreciate her work. And I chose her not only because she was an important innovator in Canadian medicine, but also because her work demonstrates a really important concept in medicine, which is that being able to cure a disease is only half the problem. You also need to be able to scale that cure up to an entire population, and that's what a lot of her work was about. So, if you've enjoyed this little tidbit of Canadian medical history, and you would like to learn more, you can visit us in person or at museumofhealthcare.ca. We have online exhibits, online articles, and a searchable catalog. Once again, my name is Rowena McGowan, curator of the Museum of Healthcare at Kingston, and my Nobel nominee is Dr. Leon Farrell. Thank you, Rowena, for that. Uh, it's really amazing to hear the story of Leon Farrell and how her research helped the development of the polio vaccine when you also consider that the first Canadian Nobel Prize laureate was Frederick Banting, who discovered insulin. All these massively important medicines, these massively important medical discoveries were made in Canada. Uh, so Leon Farrell definitely seems to be a deserving candidate. For our next candidate, we talked to Sylvia from Project of Heart. Now Project of Heart is an organization that creates resources, uh, art, a lot of different things that deal with reconciliation and Indigenous people, wanting us to understand the stories of these people, what they've been through, uh, their history and their culture. In her video, Sylvia suggests for a Nobel Peace Prize, Dr. Cindy Blackstock, who's an advocate for Indigenous children, Indigenous wellness, and Indigenous rights, and she's from British Columbia. Let's go hear what Sylvia had to say. My name is Sylvia Smith. I'm a settler, originally from Treaty 6 territory in what's now known as Saskatchewan. I've been living on unceded Algonquin territory for the past 36 years with my partner, our two daughters, and our grandson. I'm a longtime educator who worked with my students to create a residential school commemorative project called Project of Heart. This was back in 2007 when knowledge of residential schools and Indigenous perspectives in Canadian history were not well known. I'm speaking to you today to tell you why I, 
as a representative of Project of Heart, believe Dr. Cindy Blackstock ought to be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. I met Dr. Blackstock in 2010 when I and my students took a field trip to federal court in Ottawa to support her and the First Nations children who were fighting to have the same access to services that all other non-First Nations children take for granted, most specifically in the areas of health, education, and child welfare. She was sitting in the witness box with her stuffy spirit bear, giving powerful testimony as to why it was necessary to put Canada on trial for its egregious discrimination against First Nations children in almost every aspect of their lives. This was when I and the hundreds of students I'd taught since came to know and respect her tireless advocacy. For those of you who may not know, Dr. Blackstock is a member of the Gitxan Nation and represents the voices of over 160,000 First Nations children who've been fighting the Canadian government for over 15 years to have their basic human rights respected. In 2007, the Caring Society teamed up with the Assembly of First Nations and submitted their human rights complaint to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Few people in Canada knew what was happening or how threatening this complaint of racial discrimination would become to the federal government. Since that day in federal court, Dr. Blackstock and Spirit Bear have been championing authentic peace building. Through the Caring Society's campaigns, their education resources, and films that have been raising awareness both in Canada and internationally, they've encouraged students, their teachers, and the families of all Canadians to learn about the unconscionable injustices that are happening in our backyards. They're inviting us to care about the inhumane treatment that First Nations children are subjected to and urge us to get involved. So many of us have. Students and teachers across Canada who do Project of Heart are learning about the intrepid Dr. Blackstock and Spirit Bear and are now part of a nationwide movement of student and teacher activists whose mission is to reach our political leaders and demand the end to systemic inequities that are robbing First Nations children and youth in this country of their childhoods. The massive work of the Caring Society's campaigns have been paying off because in 2016, after six years of continuously fighting Canada in federal court, whose lawyers were using legal loopholes to evade their responsibilities, the Human Rights Tribunal found Canada guilty of systemic racism and ordered the federal government to stop the discrimination and implement equitable funding practices immediately. But peace building doesn't come easy and it did not come easy for Dr. Blackstock and her team or those she's fighting for. Still, in 2022, today, she and Spirit Bear and the armies of caring young Canadians are fighting to have Canada fully comply with the tribunal's orders. Dr. Blackhawk, Blackstock, Dr. Blackstock has testified multiple times over the various legal proceedings in federal court since 2016 and submitted numerous affidavits. There have been over 15 litigations since 2012 and the legal battle is ongoing as of August 2020. I think it's important that all young people in Canada know how hard Dr. Blackstock works to ensure Canada respects the law. Through an almost impossible schedule of speaking engagements, meetings and conferences, she liaises with individuals and organizations across Canada and throughout the world. She does so all the while teaching at McGill University's Faculty of Social Work and fulfilling her obligations as the Executive Director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. Currently, Dr. Blackstock holds four academic degrees, 21 honorary doctorates, sits on 14 advisory boards, has been a presenter and expert advisor to various United Nations committees, to UNICEF, and 20 other international organizations. She's been the executive producer of seven films and curatorial exhibits, 
has publications in 48 journals and written 29 book chapters. She has presented to Senate committees and House of Commons committees 16 times, spoken at over 300 community events and conferences, and has been invited to speak 140 times at universities and colleges across Canada, Australia, and the United States. In her efforts to usher in an era of justice and equity for First Nations children by standing up to power and winning, her activism has been covered over 390 times by various media outlets. Perhaps one of the most gripping moments for news coverage of Dr. Blackstock was in 2014, when she found out that under the Conservative government at the time, both the Justice Department and the Department of Aboriginal Affairs were spying on her in retaliation for her court action. So what would the world and how would we as Canadians benefit if Dr. Blackstock were to win a Nobel Peace Prize? Dr. Blackstock's belief in the ultimate power of love to transform systems of oppression is her modus operandi. She helps us believe in our own power and to use that power to uplift those who don't have it. She encourages us through educating for reconciliation and knowing the truth of our history, that we can change the course of history. We can stop the onslaught of colonial violence that our government policy has wreaked upon First Nations children and has been the common practice of so many governments worldwide in their dealings with original peoples. And it's this faith, it's this belief that if we have the moral courage to speak truth to power, as she does, that transformation can take place. It is this transformative action, powered by love, that truly builds peace. In closing, Project of Heart believes Dr. Blackstock ought to win the Nobel Peace Prize because in her fight for the equality rights of the most vulnerable, she also helps Canadians to connect the dots. Her fight and that of First Nations children has become ours as well. Doing reconciliation work through inviting all Canadians to come on board is offering much more than a Band-Aid solution when it comes to building peace. Dr. Blackstock's peace building comes through fighting with truth being her ammunition, and the hearts and minds of children and youth being her standing armies. The battlefields are the highest courtrooms in our country, and the spoils of this epic battle being fought daily are the rights of all First Nations children, their families, and their nations to control their own lives. Dr. Blackstock's fight, the fight for justice, will not end until her vision becomes a reality. And I believe that if Alfred Nobel were alive today, he would wholeheartedly be in favor of awarding Dr. Blackstock this most prestigious honor. Jimmy Gwetch. Thank you, Sylvia, for that contribution. I think the case for Dr. Blackstock is absolutely clear. Uh, Cindy Blackstock is someone who was and is involved in Indigenous activism, uh, specifically in terms of Indigenous children. She's someone who has done massive work before and continues to do so, and is the first candidate on our list today who is still eligible, is still alive, and could still win a prize today. For this next candidate, we're going back into the scientific realm a little bit. We talked to Julie from Discover the Universe. Discover the Universe is an organization that creates pedagogical resources for teachers and students that deal specifically with astronomy. At Defining Moments Canada, we've actually worked with Discover the Universe before on the Herzberg 50 project where we talked about spectroscopy in space exploration. Now, Julie is presenting a research group on exoplanets from Quebec. Let's go hear what she has to say. Hello, my name is Julie and I am the director of an astronomy education program called Discover the Universe. I've been working in the field of astronomy education for over 20 years and I used to work at the observatory in Victoria called the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. So I used to give tours around the observatory and talk a bit about the science that happened there. And one of the very interesting fields of research that happened there actually could have led to a Nobel Prize. 
but they just missed it. <laughs> so just to tell you a bit how it worked. Um, so it's in the search for exoplanets. The first planet, so an exoplanet is a planet around another star. The first exoplanet confirmed around a star similar to our sun uh, was announced in 1995 by a uh, team uh, from Switzerland. Um, and they ended up winning the Nobel Prize in 2019. Now, how do you find planets around other stars? It's actually very tricky because, well, for the most part, I and mean, for the majority of them, you don't see them. You don't see those planets directly. So one way uh, to discover them is actually use the, the, the gravitational pull that those planets have on their whole star. So we sometimes say that planets orbit around stars like this. Well, it's not completely true, actually, because if you have a big planet, let's say Jupiter, going around the sun, well, Jupiter is massive enough to make the sun wobble a little bit. So they, instead of saying Jupiter orbits the sun, which we usually simplify to because that's true, the sun is a lot more massive, we could say that they both orbit the common center of mass. And in this case, Jupiter makes the biggest motion. But as you can see, the sun wobbles a little bit like this. Now, when we observe stars, we don't see the planet, but we can actually measure the motion of the star. So if we see a star wobble like this, and have, it has to be, the motion needs to be in the line of sight, so the orbit has to be a certain way for us to notice this motion, um, then we can figure out how big, how massive the planet is that's in orbit. Because a star would not wobble like this by itself. There needs to be something else in its orbit, in orbit around it, that affects this, its motion. And so it has to be a big planet, and because of the, 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 the motion and how it moves, we can actually detect how big, how far it is from the star, and so on. So this, to be able to detect this motion, though, it's extremely small. And the team using the telescopes in Victoria, the team led by Bruce Campbell and Gordon Walker, both from the University, uh, I believe actually uh, Go uh, Bruce was from the University of Victoria and Gordon Walker was from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Well, they're, both of them with their research team were really able to um, improve this technique of measuring the motion of the star and really improve the precision we could get. The, what they did, uh, they observed many stars, they improved the resolution of the motion they were able to get, uh, but they unfortunately never discovered an obvious planet around the star. Um, and then they published their papers and other teams around the world will learn about this technique. They used that technique and in 1995 again the Swiss team announced the first exoplanet, big Jupiter-like planet around a star. Um, so the work by Bruce Campbell and Gordon Walker was necessary to lead to that discovery. They just never found the planet themselves, but um, it was obviously a very good work. And now it's, uh, it's sometimes acknowledged as they were the only precursors and they, let, they paved the way for the other team to win the Nobel Prize. So great achievement by Canadians, but unfortunately never made it in the big media because not everybody heard about it. So there you go. That's the story of a missed Nobel Prize for Canadian astronomers. Thank you, Julie. It's really wonderful to hear all this groundbreaking research that's being done in Canada still today on things like exoplanets. And one thing that's interesting to note is there's actually never been any French Canadians. There's been people from Quebec, but no French Canadians who have ever won a Nobel Prize. So this would be a first for Canada. For this next candidate, we went to an organization that we've worked with multiple times at Defining Moments Canada. We've done many military history projects like Juno 75, VE Day 75, and we've worked with the RCMI, the Royal Canadian Military Institute. So we went to see Ryan, who's the curator of the RCMI, an organization that has exhibits and resources about Canadian military history. Ryan nominated a candidate that actually isn't linked with military history, but is linked with himself personally. He's presenting a cancer research advocate from Manitoba. Let's go hear what he has to say. My name is Ryan Goldsworthy. I'm the museum director and curator of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, which is one of the oldest uh, museums in Canada and certainly the largest military history museum in Toronto. So this candidate really speaks to me not only on the professional level, but on a personal level as well. And that individual would be Mr. Terry Fox. So why I would think that Terry Fox would be an excellent candidate as a recipient of the Nobel Prize would be for his contributions to medical research. And most obviously, as Canadians know, to cancer research. So 
during Terry's time, of course, he became noteworthy for his famous um, you know, Marathon of Hope as he set out to run across Canada, coast to coast, despite the fact that he had lost his leg to osteosarcoma. So when Terry set out on his journey, his initial goal was to raise $1 for every Canadian. And in 1980, this would have been about $22 million raised. Also, something to note is that cancer at the time was a relatively taboo subject. It didn't have the level of awareness that it does in 2022. So it was a great cause from that aspect because it became a national news story. In fact, a global news story in terms of bringing cancer and cancer research to the forefront. And Terry, of course, was a young man himself. So the fact that not only did he raise cancer awareness in general, but the fact that cancer also affects young people as well, childhood cancer, people who are in the prime of their life. Like Terry was a very you know, active, physically fit individual. And the fact that cancer had afflicted him so strongly was, I think, an important lesson for Canadians to learn, to be aware of. Uh, so during his run, obviously he was unable to complete because his cancer returned. It had metastasized and sadly it spread to his lungs. We know the story, despite his great personal bravery to continue, you know, the coughing, all the signs were there, but he pushed and pushed as far as he went uh, to just outside Thunder Bay, where he had to leave and depart and to continue to, continue to receive treatment. As we know, he passed away shortly thereafter. But the one thing he's, one of his quotes I would like to share and as part of this process and why I think he should be eligible for the Nobel Prize now that we're striking at that question is, I've said before to people that I'm going to do my very best to make it. I'm not going to give up, but I might not make it. If I don't, the marathon of hope better continue. And I think this is what really strikes at the importance of what Terry did and his legacy was not only what he did in his short lifetime, but what's been accomplished since that time in his name. So as I understand it, um, the Nobel Prize is not awarded to organizations at, at present. It's an individual award. But uh, what I would like to suggest is a potential change to that. And I know Terry is gone and he's an individual who inspired the movement. You know, but the Terry Fox Foundation has raised approximately $850 million for cancer research you know, since Terry's passing in the early 1980s. And it's made huge impact on you know, cancer um, treatments and further awareness to a point, and this is the great fact I like to use is if Terry Fox had been alive today and was diagnosed with the exact same osteosarcoma diagnosis, treatment has come along to such an extent that he would have been saved. And that in part is a result of what he started in the Marathon of Hope and what continues to happen in his name. And I think for those reasons, the incalculable amount of lives, both young people, young and old Canadians and globally, I mean, the Terry Fox Foundation uh, receives donations worldwide. There are Terry Fox runs across the world. Now schools participate on an annual basis. He's one of those Canadians that really transcends our borders um, as a quintessential individual. And I know that Nobel Prize isn't awarded based on someone's personal characteristics, whether or not they were a good person. We know plenty of recipients, maybe were not the most ethical people personally, but if I can add, I think Terry was one of these individuals who was almost superhuman in his selflessness and his ability to endure pain for a greater cause. Um, one quote I'd like to say from Terry, which really adds to this, uh, who he was as an individual. He said, no matter what pain I suffer, it is nothing compared to the pain of those who have cancer, of those who endure treatment. And he also added, I'm not doing the run to become rich and famous. It was never about itself, 
And for that reason, I've always viewed him as the quintessential Canadian, sort of as the archetype of this is someone who had no personal agenda, no desire to become, you know, a noteworthy individual, but rather his task from the very beginning was to very purposeful to raise money for those who were suffering. I mean, he knew many people in his time and his treatment who had suffered and died, and he was doing it for that reason. And he always made that com these comments. These are a couple quotes that I've shared, but the more you read about every stop along Terry's journey in 1980, he always comes back to, it's not about me. It's not about the pain. Like think about all those thousands, many thousands of Canadians who are suffering, you know, in, in cancer treatment centers right now, you know, wasting away. This is the task here. This is the objective. And I think that's, for his personal qualities is why the, the Terry Fox Foundation in part has been so successful. It's because he's someone who is inspiring on a personal level. He's someone who is really unimpeachable um, in terms of his character and also his cause. And that is such a rarity in, in history and our society today. And so he's just such a great example of someone we want to award. And I think I would never speak for Terry, but I think that he himself, and this is just a testament to his character, a further testament to his character, is that he himself would never envision himself being eligible for a award like this. He would never, he would almost feel too humble or too modest to even think about something like this. And that's why it's up to others to advocate on his behalf because of his modesty, his humility, his selflessness. And that really just adds to his case even further, in my uh, humble opinion. And if I can add a personal note, um, you know, like Terry, this isn't about myself either. I just, you know, I'm happy to advocate on his behalf. But I'm a cancer survivor myself. And, you know, I suffered from a very similar cancer to Terry's. Uh, I had a sarcoma when I was 16 years old. I was diagnosed with cancer. Very similar um, adolescent bone cancer. And again, I'm here today speaking to you because of efforts, you know, started by Terry and continued by the Terry Fox Foundation. You know, without those efforts, there's a very, very good possibility that I would not have survived. I mean, the cancer that I had was very close to my brain. Um, the early detection we have now, the, now the, the efficiency of chemotherapies and radiation and again, awareness. So now, you know, over the last 40 years, the doctors and medical professionals who have been inspired by Terry or in, indirectly or indirectly, and now who are, you know, on the front lines, researching and administering treatments. I think all of this goes back to, again, to what Terry did. So on a personal level, I've been moved. He helped me in my challenge in overcoming and conquering cancer. And as a human, I love him and as a quintessential role model and someone who did the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, how much easier and understandable would it have been for him to just simply not do this arduous physical journey across Canada, but to continue to receive treatment and to recover and spend time with his family. But he threw all of that away in the hope that we could continue um, his efforts and to you know bring cancer to a greater awareness. So, I mean, that really sums up succinctly, I think, why Terry and by extension, the Terry Fox Foundation, if the Nobel Prize would be, you know, extended to organizations, why they would be um, eligible for such a prestigious prize. Thank you, Ryan. I think truly you make such a strong case for Terry Fox having an impact globally, not only in terms of money raised, but in terms of being a motivator, being a role model, being someone who people can look up to as well. His icon and his image is almost just as important as the actual money raised and the impact that he's had. Finally, another collaborator we went to is the Vimy Foundation. This organization puts together pedagogical resources for students and teachers learning about the First World War. They do trips through Europe. They have the Vimy Pilgrimage Prize and the Beaverbrook Prize, which actually bring deserving high school students to Europe to the battlefields. Uh, when we asked them to contribute a video, they actually turned to one of the people who had been on one of those battlefield tours. Sarah is presenting Clooney McPherson, who's a doctor from Newfoundland. Let's go hear what she had to say. At dawn, when the light is soft and hides the telltale signs of a burgeoning modern society, 
it's easy to picture old St. John's. The turn of the 20th century, the age of discovery and innovation. In this new and exciting place, Clooney McPherson boarded a troop ship, not knowing that in less than a year he would save thousands of lives. Born in March of 1879, the eldest son of Emma Duder and Campbell McPherson proved to be a gentleman, steadfast in his desire to heal others. After receiving his early education at the Methodist College of St. John's, he moved to Montreal to study medicine at McGill University, earning his MD in 1901. By 1910, he'd practiced medicine in Edinburgh, Scotland, Battle Harbor, Labrador, and back home in St. John's and the surrounding rural communities. McPherson enlisted in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment immediately following the outbreak of the First World War. Just a few months after his deployment overseas in 1915, he came face to face with what he named the Devil. Great green clouds of blinding, acidic gas that choked all it touched. He watched as his fellow soldiers writhed in the trenches, and civilians scream as the wind blew the gas into their homes. He saw pure terror overtake the camp every time the gas alarm sounded. He knew that these horrors could not be allowed to continue. Working as quickly and efficiently as possible, Macpherson developed many prototype masks, and even gassed himself to see if they worked, inhaling what he later described as more chlorine gas than was comfortable into the lungs. His most successful prototype, known as the Hypo Hood, essentially a cloth bag drenched in a chlorine blocking solution with either a thin sheet of transparent mica stone at the front or a patch of clear film, exceeded the expectations of his colleagues. When put to the test, even the soldier wearing it did not know he had been exercising in a chamber filled with a gas ten times more potent than what was even used in warfare. Production of this first ever gas mask thus began immediately. Over the course of a few months, McPherson made further improvements, like changing the eyepiece from that thin sheet of mica stone to two circular pieces of glass and metal, and adding a valve to serve as a mouthpiece. The solution the mask was dipped in also evolved to be a more effective against a wider range of poisonous gases. This new mask was dubbed the pH mask, and quickly became the most popular First World War era model. All modern gas masks, and even some respirators, can be traced back to McPherson's hypo hood. Over the years, these masks have saved thousands, if not millions, of lives, and jump-started the practice of using masks to protect against respiratory illnesses and irritants. We all know how important that work would prove to be. And returning to the war years, it was one of the main inventions which turned the tide of victory back from the Central Powers to the Allies. So why wasn't Macpherson honored by the Nobel Prize Foundation for his work? According to their own criteria, Macpherson would have been eligible for a prize in the field of medicine and physiology. He was an individual, his invention certainly had international influence, and while the prize tends to favor discoveries over inventions, this alone certainly would not have disqualified him. The only thing that did? Nobel Prizes are not awarded during the years Sweden is surrounded by conflict. There was no winner in 1915, even though there definitely was, at the very least, one man deserving of it. Back on St. John's historic Gower Street, though, the church that Macpherson loved still stands. And venturing aside, there is an ethereal stained glass window depicting the honored figure of St. John nestled into the sanctuary that continues to quietly bear his name. And so, Clooney McPherson may not have been able to walk the hallowed halls of the Karolinska Institutet with all the other Nobel laureates, but he was loved and remembered dearly by his community. And sometimes, well, that might be all that matters doesn't mean that the thought wouldn't have been nice, though. Thank you, Sarah, for that really thorough story where we really see all these archival images and we see through the story that you tell the immediate and global impact of Clooney McPherson's discovery. This is something 
when we talk about Nobel Prizes, some people get Nobel Prizes for a career of inventions, a career of, of contribution, like Gerhard Herzberg, who won in 1971, for his contribution to the field in spectroscopy. Others win because of a groundbreaking discovery, and this would really be Clooney McPherson's case. Before we conclude the video, I actually want to contribute a nomination myself. Uh, today we've talked about Canadians who would be eligible for prizes such as medicine, uh, scientific prizes like physics and chemistry, for the Peace Prize, but we haven't talked about literature. Uh, literature being one of the Nobel Prizes and one that Canada has won before. Alice Munro won fairly recently a Nobel Prize for Literature for her short stories and her contribution to literature. I think someone else in Canada who could and who should still win a Nobel Prize is Dany Laferriere. Dany Laferriere is an author who's originally from Haiti and lives in Quebec and has lived in Quebec for decades. He's written extensively on the immigrant experience. He's written poetry. He's written plays. He's written novels. He is a public intellectual. He is the first Canadian, the first Quebecois, and the first Haitian to be nominated to l'Académie Française, which is the most prestigious literary institution in the French language. Uh, he is also only the second black man to be named to that institution, and his work is globally loved, globally translated, globally accepted. Uh, he's someone who is a very important public figure in Quebec as well, and I think his contribution should be recognized. If you look at the list of Canadians who are nominated, who have won Nobel Prizes, it is a list that is very white. It is a list that is very masculine. Today, we've named people who were mostly women. We've named people who are indigenous in the case of Sydney Blackstock. Uh, but it's important to recognize the experience of immigrants, the experience of people, of, of racialized people in Canada. And I think Daniel Laferriere not only himself is black, but in his writings really contributes to speaking on the immigrant experience and really encapsulates the Canadian experience, the Canadian attitude through it. So I think he's someone who would absolutely be deserving uh, and someone who I would like to see win a Nobel Prize. Those are all the candidates I want to present on our video today. But those are far from being the only Canadians who are worthy of recognition and who could be worthy of Nobel Prizes. The Nobel Foundation has very strict and particular criteria and characteristics as to who can win and who should win a Nobel Prize. I hope this video opened up kind of a question as to what is a deserving person? What does the prize mean? And what does it mean to win or not to win the Nobel Prize? I hope this also leads to questioning about the Nobel Prize, about who wins it. How come the list of Canadian Nobel laureates is entirely white and mostly men? How come an organization could win a Nobel Peace Prize, but an organization such as the Terry Fox Foundation can't win a prize for medicine? These questions are worth asking, these questions are important, and lead us to questioning what is the worth of the prize, who wins the prize, why do we recognize the Nobel Prize as the be-all end-all, as the most prestigious prize, and what does that mean to Canada? I hope that these, this has led to conversation. I hope that this has led to questioning. And I invite anyone who has a candidate, who has someone who thinks they should win a Nobel Prize to submit it, say it in the comments, send it to us, let us know which Canadian should have won or could have won or should still win a Nobel Prize. Thank you for listening.